Ah, I can dim lights. All right. All right, everyone, welcome to CC 312. I have, I will have the obligatory day one fight with the technology. Not too bad, just had to adjust volume. Uh, last year when I taught 116, I was in a room where I couldn't dim the light. So that was a big moment for me that the lights actually dimmed. So starting off good. Um, all right, first thing, I'm gonna close this and show you the most important thing you can uh, learn, at least today, is how to get to the course website. I made this literally as easy as possible, cse312.com. Can't forget that, you can't possibly forget. If you forget that, then you completely forgot what class you're registered for. Uh, I, I've thought about this for a while. I don't have a way to make that easier, so uh, it's as easy as I can possibly get it. Uh, so cc312.com, if you ask me uh, in office hours or something how to find the course website, unless somebody added the course after today and weren't at this lecture, that's acceptable. Um, but if any of you ask me where the course website is, uh, I'll probably just make fun of you because I, I, there's nothing more I can do. Uh, so cc312.com, this is going to have everything you need for the course. UB Learns is activated, but I use it for very minimal purposes. I will only use it for one thing. That's where the Panopto recordings, the room is going to automatically record the lectures. That's where the Panopto recordings will go. So if you go to UB Learns, go to Lecture Recordings. Panopto is good at posting right after the lecture occurs. So by the time you get to your next destination, the video should be posted today as long as everything's set up right. Uh, other than that, I'm not going to use UB Learns for anything. If you are like me and don't like UB Learns at all and don't even want to use it for the lecture recordings, the recordings will be reposted on YouTube, though you will have to wait longer for that. You have to wait for my TA to get the videos, uh, which he's not going to do until after 5 p.m. because that's my last lecture of the day. Uh, after 5 p.m., probably later that night, maybe the next day, uh, the lectures will be reposted onto YouTube. So if you don't mind waiting to rewatch the lecture, you should definitely be attending. But uh, if you wanna, don't mind waiting to rewatch the lecture and then getting YouTube's interface instead of Panopto's interface, you have that option. All right, how's everybody doing? How's, how's it feel to be back? Great, thumbs up. Hey, I'm loving it. Well, maybe I'll ask again in like a, a month or two and see, <laughs> see how you're feeling. Uh, I'm feeling good too. Um, I, I always, uh, the breaks are always too short, but you know what? Uh, we gotta get back to it at some point, so might as well get to it. All right, so let me just go down through these things uh, on the website. First, uh, Autolab, I assume you're all familiar with this by now, but if you're not, this is where we're going to submit assignments. Uh, YouTube, I talked about. Piazza, uh, I assume also you're all familiar with. This is also where the office hours are going to be posted, though, is on Piazza. If you click on Piazza, I don't think I'm logged in on this computer. Maybe I am. Yeah, I'm not logged in on this machine. Um, but this will take you directly to the link for office hours. And... Um, that office hour post will be live, as in whenever myself or the TAs, like right now it's fairly sparse. I think Swastik has his office hours up, but I don't think any of the rest of us do. I know I don't. Uh, but that'll be a live document. As we set our office hours, and occasionally we have to change our office hours, we'll edit that post. So when you go to that Piazza post, that's the live office hours. And if we have to cancel office hours, uh, most of the time my TAs in, in my, uh, well, I haven't had to cancel office hours ever, but... Uh, uh, most of the time, my TAs are good about updating the schedule and letting you know right on the schedule, hey, sorry, but this office hour is canceled today. Uh, so before you go to office hours, check the schedule. Make sure there's going to be someone there before you waste a trip. Or, um, uh, or I guess if you're going on Zoom, just go on there anyway. Office hours, we have th two, three or two types of office hours. Is anyone doing uh, no Discord office hours in this course? Okay. In 116, we also do Discord office hours. But we have two types of office hours in this course. Uh, in person, if it's a TA in person, it'll be in Davis 302 or the area outside, that common area outside of Davis 302, or Zoom office hours. If they're on Zoom, we have one Zoom meeting for the, oh, no, we don't in this course. That's 116. Uh, if it's Zoom, there will be a link to a Zoom post for each TA, uh, for a Zoom meeting for each TA on that schedule. So go to their Zoom meeting at their office hour time, and they should be there waiting for you. Uh, either with a waiting room. Mine, I have it set up to use a waiting room. So you get there and you just have to wait some undisclosed amount of time 
until I call you into the meeting one at a time. Uh, it's not the best setup, but um, you know it works. It works for what we need. In this course, office hours don't get too much traffic, so it's not usually a big deal. Usually, for my office hours at least, you get right in. But uh, we'll deal with that more as the time comes. And then finally, Discord. So uh, you're welcome to join the Discord. I use this for all my classes. If you just want to go in there and chat with other students, sometimes uh, myself and TAs will be there, but we are not there. I have to make sure I say this because uh, students get mad every semester. Sometimes myself and TAs will be on the Discord, but we are not there in any official capacity. We are not there to answer your questions about 312. We're not there to help you with the homework. Sometimes on their own volition, some TAs will. Sometimes I'll even pop in if there's a discussion that's, that everybody's confused about. I'll pop in and be like, no, that's not what I meant. Here's what I meant. But we're not doing that as part of our official duties as TAs or, or course staff or instructors. Uh, so just, uh, just be aware of that. Don't complain that we're not helping you in the Discord. And don't complain that the TAs are being irreverent in the Discord, because they will. They're going to be themselves. They're just there as themselves. And I'll be there as myself. Uh, so just, uh, just let that be known. If you want any official questions answered, if you want to talk officially about the course, as uh, talk to me as an instructor, talk to the TAs as TAs. That's what Piazza is for. So if you want that formality and official, officiality, is that even a word? Go to Piazza. If you want to kick back and just joke around, that's Discord. There is one exception to this. This uh, Can I call it a protocol? We talk about a lot of protocols in this course. I might as well call this a protocol, too. There's one exception in Discord during lecture time in the lecture channel. I'll have that open on my phone. I have it open right now. And I'll watch there as I can. Sometimes I get wrapped up in the lecture and, and uh, covering the content and everything. But I try to keep an eye on the lecture channel in Discord during lectures. Uh, so you can ask questions if you, or, or just interact. You can say whatever you want. Uh, try to keep it on topic. But you can say, like, hey, that slide didn't make any sense. Can you explain HTTP uh, request headers again? And then I can see that and be like, oh, that must have not made much sense. Let me explain that a little more. So any questions, uh, if you don't want to raise your hand, you can always raise your hand also and uh, ask a question that way. Or you can go in the lecture channel, and I can uh, uh, try to be watching that and get your questions that way as well. And there are some lectures where I'll explicitly say, hey, this is an open-ended lecture, you know, whatever you want, and then ask for suggestions in the lecture channel. Um, so that is something I'll use be in an official capacity on Discord during, the, during lectures. And I'll remind you at the beginning of each lecture, hopefully we get some traffic in there. Last semester in 312, the students didn't use it too much, but uh, I'll still use it every time. All right, let's get into the course. Course description is right from the course catalog. I'm not going to read that to you. Uh, expectations are mostly the usual things. Spend a minimum of 12 hours in the course. We have three hours of lecture. You have one meeting with your team each week. Uh, that leaves, uh, if I can do math, eight hours a week working on the homeworks and your project. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you made it this far in CSC. I'm sure you're well aware of this. CSC courses require, you know, demand a lot of effort from you, a lot of time and a lot of work. Uh, one thing that you may not have seen in other courses, maybe you, you are starting to see this at your level, at the junior level, at the 300 level, uh, and certainly at the 400 level you'll see it, is I'm not going to spoon feed you every little thing that you need to know. In lecture, I'm going to focus on concepts and conceptual topics. And then it's up to you to figure out how to code those topics in your homeworks uh, and, and get the job done. So you're going to be asked to be able to seek out, find, and understand technical documentation. This is the level where I expect you to be in a 300 level CSC course, where I'm not going to explicitly walk you through every little thing of how you do everything in the code. I assume that you're good, competent uh, programmers by the time you get here, and that you just need the information of how to do things in a specific language, in a specific framework. And for those things, I expect you to be able to find and read and understand the documentation. Um, so I don't want to hear, uh, you didn't teach us explicitly how to do this. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to teach you how to do most of the things you need to do on the homeworks. In lecture, I'm going to teach you the concept of what's going on and what you need to build. And it's up to you to figure out how to build it. Um, 
which, by the way, we, we have to, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, we have to wean you off of helping you too much by the time you graduate. So by the time you graduate, you know, you can ask senior devs, like, quick questions and things, and maybe they'll help you out depending on how much time they have. But really, this is what you have to do for your career. You're going to go out there and be a software engineer. This is what you're doing. You get some high-level tasks, add this feature to our software, and you've got to go find out how to do that, design it, find the tools to be able to build it, read the, the documentation for those tools, and apply them uh, to your uh, uh, to what you're building. I don't want this. Uh, so as you get to the three and 400 level courses, you'll see this in more and more of your courses that we're not going to hold your hand very much at all, um, which goes to this one too. In a desire, this is an elective course, so I assume that you're here to learn about web applications. Uh, if you weren't, you wouldn't be here, so I do assume that you actually want to learn this stuff as well. All right, grading. Uh, I'll save this one for, for last, the explanation. Homework, actually, I'm going to save that one for last, too. I, I'll just have to talk about one of the, <laughs> uh, the homework. There are four homework assignments. The course is split into these four assignments. The content for each assignment is covered in a three-week chunk of lecture. And then the homework is due the week after, the Friday after the lecture. That content is covered. Uh, four homeworks equally weighted, so each homework is 15% of your final grade. For the homeworks, I have a whole section on homework. You can read it at your leisure. But the big thing is there are no, uh, no I can't say no frameworks. Uh, I guess no web frameworks allowed for these homeworks. For the homework, the goal is to get you to build your own web server, essentially from scratch. And by, what, by from scratch, I mean starting with a TCP socket server and then building everything with, from HTTP up on your own uh, by starting by reading bytes from a TCP stream. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry. You're in the right place to learn all about that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the goal. So a lot of the things you'll be doing on your homework, you could pull in a web framework like Flask or Django or something and get it done like nothing. The goal in this course is to essentially rebuild what frameworks like uh, Flask uh, Django, for some reason I can only think of Python web servers right now, uh, Express, um, Play, uh, building what those frameworks do for you. That's what we want to do here. So it's very low level programming. You will get down to the byte level, and when we talk about web sockets, we'll even get down to the bit level and programming at that level to interpret what these bytes mean and then sending back the appropriate bytes to get a web server to work and function as a web application. So that's what we're here to do. If, uh, if that's not what you thought you signed up for, uh, I know when it, the course says web applications, there are a lot of, you know, you can jump to a lot of conclusions of what that means. Uh, so I do want to talk about what the course is not. It's not about just using a framework, of course. Uh, the homework explicitly says no frameworks. Uh, and there's also almost no front end development either. So if you came here for HTML, CSS, and front end JavaScript, you're also in the wrong place. So that's fine. If, you, if that's what you're expecting, you know, you, you'll probably have a better time if you drop the course. You'll learn a lot if you stay in it, uh, but that's your decision to make. I just want to make sure it's very clear what this course is. We're going to do a lot of low-level, byte-level programming on the back end of the server, on the web server side of things, not on the browser side, the client side of things. So I just want to make sure that's 100% clear so we don't get halfway through the semester and you say, where's all the, uh, where's all the HTML? Uh, it's not going to come. I have one lecture on HTML, uh, and I trim that down to like half a lecture when I actually cover it. Um, if you do want to learn about front end, uh, Alan Hunt has an excellent course, CC 370. I'm like 80% sure. 370, Human Computer Interaction. Uh, take that course. If you want to be a web developer for a profession, I recommend taking this and 370. If you take both of those courses, you are a solid full stack developer. In HCI, Human Computer Interactions, Alan teaches you all about the front end, how to make a nice usable front end, and as the name implies, how to get humans to interact with your web app. And he does basically the opposite of this course. He gives you the back end and has you build the front end. I give you a front end, or just say, we have really simple front ends, I just say, screw the front end, and then we build the back end. Take both of those courses, you have both halves of, uh, of web applications. 
Uh, for the project, you do get to use frameworks. You'll work on a team of four to five students of your choosing. And you can use every framework you want. But any frameworks you use that are not allowed on the homeworks, you have to write a report about how that framework works. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. Right, excuse me, right now, it'll be more important later in the semester. Uh, when we do form teams, which will be at the end of week four, Week five of the semester, you'll start your weekly meetings with your teammates. These meetings will replace recitation sections. So every recitation section on your schedule is canceled. You won't have to show up at those times. But if you want your weekly meetings in one of those rooms, you know those rooms will be empty. So you can take advantage of them and uh, show up at that time in that room. If you want just a quiet place to study or whatever, you know nobody's going to be there. Uh, and if there is someone there, you can say, hey, this is a 312 room. What are you doing? And, and uh, for each one of those meetings, fill out the meeting form. It doesn't happen until week five, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, but the idea is on your homework, you're learning how web applications work, how web servers work at a very low level. And then for your team project, you get to pull off all those restrictions, pull in frameworks, and see how nice it is to work with frameworks and how much they do for you. Because uh, you're never going to build anything from scratch in the real world. Uh, you're going to be using frameworks. So I want to give you experience with that as well. There will be a presentation at the end of the semester for your project. The last week of class and the final exam time. There's no final exam. There's no quizzes to everything. Notice everything that's not in this grading structure. Uh, the final exam time is used for project presentations. Up to 10 minute presentation. We'll talk about that as well when we get closer to that time. Uh, so there's the breakdown. And the last thing, I wanted to save this one for last, lecture questions. This is something new that I'm doing. I usually have the attitude of, uh, you know, lectures are recorded. Watch them whenever you want. It's up to you to keep up with the material. Well, a lot of students tend to fall behind, so I kind of begrudgingly added this. Uh, in lecture, we'll have questions that you answer. And submit them on Autolab. It, this is also new tech. So I do want to test out this tech right now. We're going to have our first lecture question, Monday, January 31st. If you log into Autolab and go to the lecture question, to simple A, B, C, D, E, every lecture question is going to look like this. And today's lecture question is, can you select A? The answer is A. <laughs> And then you always have to check this checkbox. Uh, it's kind of annoying, but you know, I don't want you cheating. And I want to see if it's going to handle 96 of you submitting at the same time. It should. I think it should be fine. Uh, but it does take a little bit to load. It always takes like 10 seconds for this to load. No, that doesn't sound good. I might have some work to do on this. Yeah, I, I see. I see that. Yeah, I was worried about this. Well, uh, we'll see how this goes. I might be able to make some improvements during the semester and get this working, but. I want to use this in 116 as well, so I'm hoping we can hoping we can get it working well. Yeah, it's crawling. Hey, I got credit. Uh, for so for lecture questions, you'll get one submission for each of them, um, and you can't submit. Well, I won't show you. The, uh, that doesn't matter. You don't even see the question until it's time. But I have to turn the question on. So you can only submit while it's on, just so somebody doesn't submit like an hour later or something. So that didn't go terrible. Like everybody, did everyone get through, get their submissions in? OK. So it, no in the back? OK. So it's, so it's, uh, we'll work on that. The, so the problem is, I was worried about this. The problem is it's grading it like a coding submission. So it's spinning up an entire Docker container to say, does student answer equal A? 
and then it destroys that Docker container, and then the next submission it spins up another one. So it's way overkill for what we're doing, uh, and that's the the problem. I was just hoping, I was just hoping to be able to handle a hundred. Uh, there's a lot of hardware behind Autolab, so I don't know. Uh, that's something I'll have to work on. Okay, grading cutoffs. I'm sure you all looked at those already. Uh, don't cheat. You, you probably heard the don't cheat speech uh, many times already. You might have even heard it from me if you took 116 with me. Uh, so I won't belabor the point, but don't cheat. And these collapse, by the way. Once we get into the semester and you don't want to scroll through all this, close them up. All right, we do have some slides today. Oh, and homework one. Do I want to go over homework one right now? Save that for Wednesday. Uh, but you can take a look at homework one. It's released. We got some slides to cover. Oh, I forgot how to do this. Do I do Finder? Open with. What do I use? Oh, no. Maybe I do just use preview. I thought I had special software to display my PDF slides. Anyway, let's talk about what the internet is. We'll cover a little bit of ground today. Uh, what we covered today isn't, uh, what's the best way to word it? It's not something you have to do on your homework, so that's why I want to cover it day one and get it out of the way. But it is some background about what we are doing in the homeworks and in the course. And if you happen to take 199 with me, you might have seen some of these slides before. But this is the accelerated version of it. This is like two and a half of those lectures uh, all rolled into a 25-minute lecture. So let's cover a little bit of ground um, and talk about what networks are. The internet is a network of networks. You might have heard that phrase before. But let's talk a little bit about what that means and what different types of networks are. So first we have a LAN. This is hardware that you're probably familiar with. You have, at least in your house, you probably have a modem and a router uh, to get Wi-Fi in your, uh, in your house. And this is the same thing that we have at UB. We have wireless access points. We have one right here. And most of us are probably connected to that wireless access point right now. That's connected to a router, uh, which connects all machines on UB's campus together through this nice uh, Wi-Fi. Those are usually connected to ISPs. UB's network is not. But your home network is probably connected to an ISP. This is where we're getting regional level connections. And this is the important point is that the ISP and all the other networks that we talk about, it's the same idea as your home network, as your LAN. They have routers and they got cables. The cables are bigger, the routers are bigger, but it's the same exact idea. So we have this network that's connecting houses together and buildings together through the utility, utility lines, either in the poles or buried underground. These are just big cables that plug houses into each other. The next level up, we have tier one networks, which are going to effectively plug cities into each other. These are the, the uh, nationwide networks. These are the, um, the continent-wide networks and even the worldwide networks. Tier one networks, these are the networks that the ISPs pay for internet service. So just like we pay our ISPs and say, here's money, give me internet access, let me connect to your network. Uh, the ISPs go to the tier ones and say, hey, here's my money. I want to be able to connect to what effectively is the internet. These tier one networks have these huge networks, huge cables, uh, and they also have what's called peering agreements with each other. So all these tier one networks which are, I have a few examples on the next slide. These tier one networks all have their own networks that span huge distances. And they have peering agreements to be able to use each other's networks free of charge. So effectively, all of the tier one networks combined form what we call the backbone of the internet. And if there's anything you can point to and say that is the internet, I would point to the tier one networks. The tier ones with their peering agreements, which they effectively all act as one big network, that is the internet. If you're not connected to that big tier one network, uh, you're not really connected to the internet. You're just connected to everybody with your same ISP. Uh, 
uh, UB has what's called the T1 connection. They pay the tier ones directly. They don't mess around with Verizon Fios or uh, I almost said Roadrunner, whatever it's called now, Spectrum I, it is, uh, that they changed their name to. Um, they don't mess around with that. They just pay the tier ones directly, which is why UB doesn't have an ISP. So this is what's, uh, what is the internet, is these tier one networks that our ISPs pay. This brings up a, a unique challenge. We have these massive, massive networks. We have an entire ISP that has to connect to a tier one. We have multiple tier ones that have to connect to each other. When you have networks at, of this magnitude that need to connect to each other, we need a lot of cables. Uh, we do this in what's called internet exchanges. I believe this is uh, the entire sixth floor of 60 Hudson, if I'm not mistaken, is just a whole bunch of cables plugging uh, many networks, tier ones and ISPs together, uh, connecting their routers, connecting their networks together. It's a huge, very physical uh, problem to solve. So we have these internet exchanges all over the all over the place to be able to make these connections. When I showed you the tier ones, I only showed you pictures of the United States, kind of on purpose, because there's the question of how do we connect multiple continents that have to span oceans? Uh, this is a very, you know, it sounds like a very challenging task, and of course it is. Uh, but we know that we can go on the internet and talk to people in China, we can talk to people in India, we can talk to people in, in Europe. Uh, we're all connected. It's a worldwide internet. And we do that with big frickin' cables. Uh, we, we tend to, or at least I used to, think that the internet was very wireless. When we're connected to the internet, we're, there's no wires connecting us to the Wi-Fi. We're just wirelessly connected. But that's very, very limited. That's only from our devices to that access point right there. If we're connecting to somebody, say, in, in China, there's a physical cable from that box right there all the way to China. You can follow a physical cable all the way until like the last little bit where at the very end of that, uh, the packets are information's journey, that at the very end, there's another access point, presumably, unless they're connected to Ethernet. There's another access point and then another little hop to, um, to your friend's device that's wireless. Everything else is wired. Even crossing the oceans is just a big frickin' cable filled with a whole bunch of fiber. So the Internet is a very physical thing between these Internet exchanges, between the cables running uh, in our utility lines, so even crossing the oceans, you think, why not you know, beam up to a satellite and then beam down? Uh, we, have the, the, uh, uh, we have the technology for that. Uh, the, I, I opened the door for this. Now i got to talk about it. But uh, we, we have the technology for, for really high satellites. That's, uh, uh, the problem is the round-trip time. Your lag is way too much when using traditional satellites. But we do have Earthlink. Elon Musk is working on Earthlink using lower orbit satellites to get that round trip time down, to get the ping time down. And we'll see how that goes. I, I have high hopes. I, I'd like to see that be something really cool where we can actually get rid of a lot of these cables, just connect to the satellites directly in Earthlink. Uh, he, they launched a lot of satellites. Elon's got a lot of satellites up there, uh, and they're doing a lot of testing and growing it. So we'll see how that goes. And, uh, I might have to update my slides and say, we don't use cables anymore. Who would use a, a physical internet? Let's just beam up to the satellites. Uh, so the future looks fun. And even private companies have their own uh, satellite cables. So Google is huge. They have a massive internet presence. And they say, well, I don't want to pay these tier one networks too much money. Uh, so Google has actually laid their own, some of their own submarine cables to span these oceans. Uh, Google's network is actually really, really big. thought I had a picture of it. Maybe I deleted it when I cut it down for 312. Uh, but Google's network is actually really big. I guess this picture captures most of it. Uh, to the point where Google said, hey, we have a network that's comparable to a tier one network, uh, and we're in a lot of cities. Why don't we go into certain cities and just be an ISP? And then they control every aspect of you know, those users' lives, those users' internet lives, 
Uh, and that's where we get Google Fiber. Then they, of course, uh, the ISPs fight back, uh, a lot of legal battles and things like that. But Google Fiber is Google saying, we got a network. <laughs> Let's just uh, let people use our network directly. Because they've spent billions on cables to wrap the whole earth in cables. So we're all connected to each other. That's great. But what do we want to do? When you have a, a huge app, you have uh, a YouTube or, or Snapchat or whatever whatever app you want to go to, uh, cc312.com. Uh, the apps are hosted at data centers, which are just huge buildings filled with servers. So this is really what we want to connect to when we're connecting to the internet, is these data centers. Uh, this data center is in Lockport, not too far from here. This is a Yahoo data center. Uh, even Yahoo, I mean, it, it, it's, I don't know, a dying company. I don't know what's the most polite way to say it. Even they need huge data centers. They have multiple data centers of this size. Uh, Google has uh, an undisclosed number of data centers like this. They don't like telling everybody where their data centers are. Um, lots of them. Inside these data centers, it's just racks and racks and racks of servers. It's a beautiful site. It's uh, each one of these, if you haven't seen a, a server before, a server is just is all the same hardware that's in your laptop, but it's shaped uh, in a different shape, and uh, the hardware is chosen a little differently. Um, let me back up a second. The hardware is chosen just a little bit differently because they're made to run 24-7, so they need processors that aren't going to overheat. Um, they, use, they can have uh, a lot more RAM than your laptop, things like that. But it's the same technologies that, that you're using. Um, and then they're shaped differently so they can fit in these racks. Those are really the only big differences. You can use your laptop as a server if you don't mind your laptop running 24-7. You can host a web app on your laptop. Um, servers are just made to fit in these racks, and the hardware is chosen in a specific way for whatever need they, uh, they have. So if it's a YouTube server, it's probably going to have a lot of huge hard drives so it can store all the YouTube videos. Uh, if it's a, a web app without a lot of data, it's probably got like a lot of RAM, a lot of CPU, things like that. It's the same uh, technologies in your laptop, though. Uh, and then those buildings from the previous slide, this is what they look like inside. This isn't the same building as the previous slide, um, but this is what they look like, just racks and racks and racks of servers. To run our favorite apps. All right, so we're connected. We got the data centers. We got cables connecting us to those data centers. We got Wi-Fi for the last little bit uh, of, the desk, of the trip. But how are we actually going to use these wires? Enter TCP IP. We're going to talk about IP first. I thought it should be IP TCP, but uh, I, I lose that battle. Uh, TCP IP, I guess it rolls off the tongue better. I don't know. But IP, this is the protocol of the internet, literally named internet protocol. This is how we use those wires at the very basic root level is, uh, is how we communicate to each other. So IP, uh, IP so it's specifically IPv4 uh, that I'll talk about first, is a way to send data to any other device connected to the internet Oh, I looked at my phone to check the time. Um, to connect to any other inter device on the internet. So if we're all connected through cables, you know, just the, the straight up, like, most blatant kind of dumb way to do it would be to just send a packet over those wires and broadcast that to everybody else who's connected on the internet. Of course, we don't want to do that for a lot of reasons. Uh, so we want to send a message to a very specific person or rather a specific device connected to the internet. The way we do that is when you connect to the internet, you get an IP address, and that is your location on the internet in a very real way. It's effectively the same as your mailing address. That's how people send things to you. When they send things to you, they're going to send them in, I usually call them packets. You'll hear them called dat datagrams sometimes. But you'll, uh, we'll send packets over the internet, and these packets have two parts, a, pay, a header and a payload. The header has a lot of meta information. Most importantly, the source and destination IP addresses. Where is this thing going, and where did it come from? 
the two most important pieces of information in an IP packet. And then the payload is just bytes. It's bytes of information, ones and zeros, that's all it is. And usually those bytes encode other protocols. In this course, those protocols are going to be TCP and HTTP. So we find the IP address for a machine on the internet. We put together a packet. We set the, the destination address to that IP address, and we send those bytes to that device on the internet. That's IP. IPv4, which I showed, where it's uh, four 32-bit integers separated by dots. It's actually just one 32-bit integer. Uh, but as humans, we don't like reading these really big numbers, so we separate them by dots and have them go from 0 to 255, just so they're easier for us, for humans. The machines just see a 32-bit integer. So 32 bits, that gives us about 4.3 billion IP addresses, which sounds like a lot. When IPv4 was first created, this probably sounded like an infinite number of devices, of devices connected to the Internet. I mean, nobody knew the Internet would blow up to what it is today. Uh, so looking at that and saying, yeah, 4.3 billion, I think we're good. But once you, once you compare it to modern day where um, that's not enough for everybody to connect to the Internet even, if every human being on the planet had an Internet connection, uh, they can't all simultaneously connect even with this. Uh, and a lot of us have multiple devices. i got two right here. I need two IP addresses, two of UB's IP addresses to be able to uh, just, just to be able to stay in here. And I assume a lot of you do as well, have multiple devices right now. Uh, so that 4.3 billion really turns into a small number once we have a worldwide global internet. So we needed a solution. Uh, it, it seems like not too long ago, but now I'm sure it's probably like 20 years ago or something, uh, time flies. But we needed a solution for this, so IPv6 was proposed, IPv5 was proposed, and nobody liked it, so we chose IPv6 to be the prevailing, uh, the prevailing protocol. This uses 128-bit addresses, or 2 to the 128 total addresses, or this number, this many total addresses available, which at the risk of sounding as naive as the proposers of IPv4, I'm going to confidently say that that's enough. That's going to be, it's going to be good. We're going to be fine. This number is uh, quite large. It's comparable to, oh, I have to try to do some quick math here. Is it? I want to say it's comparable to the number of atoms in the, uni the known universe. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's close to that. It's at least within a few orders of magnitude from the number of atoms in the universe. So even if every atom in the universe gets its own IP address, like we good. We're going to be fine. Uh, so that should be enough. Uh, both protocols are simultaneously uh, being used right now. So if you check your IP address, it can be IPv4, it can be IPv6, it might be either one uh, at any given time. So there was a big deal, this was a big deal when IPv6 first came out. All the routers of the internet had to be updated to be able to speak both protocols. There are all kinds of tricks and ways to get around uh, routers that only spoke IPv4. It would be IPv6 tunneling and all kinds of different stuff. Uh, these days, I assume that most or all Routers controlling the internet speak both uh, protocols at this point. So it's not a, as big of a concern as it used to be. It's a big transition, though. It's a big change for the internet. Um, another problem with this is even with separated by dots and four smaller numbers separated by dots, it's still not very human readable. We don't want to memorize all these numbers. It gives me flashbacks to the day when we had to memorize phone numbers, and those days sucked. So we want to memorize just names. So we have domain name service, uh, services, and what this does is lets us associate domain names to IP addresses. So when you type in cc312.com, that first goes to a domain, uh, a DNS. The DNS says, here's the IP address for that domain name, and then your browser makes a request for that IP address. The internet only speaks IP addresses, so we have to have this layer of DNS on top of that 
and send, uh, send messages to the DNS. We have the IP addresses for the DNS servers uh, pre-installed on our machines, and you can change them if you want. You can use different DNS servers. Uh, sends an IP packet to the DNS server, get the answer back, and then send our request to that IP address. Uh, and you can use IP addresses directly if you want. If you want to be cool, I guess. Uh, some sites don't allow it, though. If you click on this, I believe this is Google. Uh, this site, it was so long ago I, I made that one that, uh, that I chose that IP address that I forgot what it is. But it's some site that doesn't allow direct IP access. It forces you to go through a DNS. Uh, this is what a, an internet packet looks like, and this is what most of these protocols are, is this right here. This is the most important part of IPv4, in my opinion, I guess, um, is what the bytes mean. So when you're sending information over the wire, you can only send ones and zeros. High voltage, low voltage, light, no light if it's copper, fiber, whatever. Ones and zeros is all we can speak. So what this uh, designates is what those ones and zeros mean. And we do that by giving fixed length fields and then saying these ones and zeros mean this. So the first four ones and zeros or the first half byte of an IP packet is going to be the version of that IP packet. And the next half a byte is going to be the IHL. Oh, I forgot what that means. Uh, insert something cool and porn. And total length and uh, so on and so forth until we get to the two most important ones, source and destination addresses. So just by the order of the ones and zeros, we can, uh, we can think of it as a big array and then look at certain uh, sections of that array to get the information that we need out of it. So the IP protocol, it's the IP, it says... When you send a packet, send all the bytes in this order, and then the routers will read them in that same order. And if we're consistent, we'll be able to speak IP. That's all the protocol is, is the order of the bytes. With a, 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 a router speaking IP has what's called routing tables, where it's going to look at usually just a prefix of the IP address and figure out what that packet's next hop will be. So it'll read the destination address and then decide which router that it's connected to, where it should go. So if this router needs to send a packet, it's going to read the, uh, it's going to read the IP address and then send it to one of its neighboring routers depending on that IP address. And that's it. That's all a router does. There are a lot of problems with this is that the router never checks if the packet got, the, got to its final destination, and it doesn't even check if it made it to the router to which it sent that packet. Routers are very simple devices. On purpose, they're designed for speed. They are not designed for accuracy. So what we get a lot are dropped packets, probably a term you've heard before. When a packet doesn't make it to its destination, you just lose that packet, and that's it. The routers don't care either. The routers just say... I sent it. I sent it to the next hop. Uh, I don't know what happened over there. And there can be a multitude of reasons why it doesn't make it. Maybe the router's offline. Maybe somebody was digging and cut a cable. Uh, maybe the power went out somewhere. There all kinds of reasons why, uh, why a packet doesn't make it to its destination. It's a common thing. It's just something we have to deal with. IP does not care if your packets make it to its destination. It's not what it's made for. So the internet in general is a very unreliable network. Your data may never make it to its destination. So we need another answer to this. It's the other half of our TCP IP, TCP Transmission Control Protocol. This is what's going to be a layer on top of IP, which is going to give us reliability. So with TCP, instead of just sending the packet, well, we're still going to send the packet over IP, but we're going to do a little bit first. We're going to do a three-way, what we call a three-way handshake to establish a connection with, uh, with the other device which, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the details, but it establishes a connection. It verifies that the client and server are both speaking TCP properly, 
and then they can start communicating using TCP. Once they make a connection, when they send data using TCP, instead of sending everything in one, uh, one packet and just hoping it gets there, um, I forgot to mention earlier, but packets have a fixed size. There's a maximum size of a packet in, for IP. So when you want to send information that's larger than that size, you have to send multiple packets for a single, uh, for a single transmission. So if I have something that's a, a gigabyte file that I want to download, it's got to be chopped up into many, many, many packets, and then I get it in many different packets. What TCP does is give each one of those packets a sequence number, and then when I get all those packets, which might be received out of order, they might have taken different paths through the internet, when I get all those packets, I'm going to look at all the sequence numbers, reassemble the original message, and then I'm going to check if any sequence numbers are missing. If I have a sequence number missing, a packet with a sequence number that's missing, I'm going to say, hey, we got a drop packet here. I'm going to send back to the server and be like, hey, can you resend packet with sequence number 52? And it's going to resend it. I can get that, resemble my message, get my file, and then be on my, uh, be on my way. So it gives us a way to have some checks to make sure that we can detect and correct dropped packets. And after this three-way handshake, we're going to have at the end here, hey, this is how many packets I'm going to send you. Make sure you get all these sequence numbers. So if the last one is lost, we can still detect that too. TCP makes sure that we always get the information that we send over this unreliable internet. Uh, TCP, IP is where we get IP addresses. TCP is where we get port numbers. TCP defines the, the idea of a port number which will be something we, uh, we deal with a lot in this semester, in this course. So in your code, when you work on your homeworks, you're going to pull in libraries, use whatever libraries you need to be able to establish a TCP connection. So everything we talk about today, IP, TCP, you're going to pull in a library to be able to do all of that for you. And then we're going to start with HTTP. That's where you're going to start coding. If you do want to learn more about TCP and IP, Modern Networking Concepts has got you covered. They go way in depth of, uh, you know, instead of a 25-minute lecture that we had today, it's this lecture blown up to a whole semester. They talk about all kinds of protocols and how, uh, how routers update their forwarding tables, et cetera. In this course, we assume it works, and we just use libraries for TCP connections. Right. Welcome to CSC 312, and I'll see everyone Wednesday.